How you doing, folks? Welcome to Q&A number 10. Um, how do I interpret the Bible? How do I interpret the Bible? This question comes up a lot. People ask, you know, how do I understand it on my own? And, um, you know, I can tell you right now, we all we all need mentors and guides. Uh, that's, that's just uh, the story of life for all of us. So there needs to be a realization that God ordained men to be pastor teachers. We all have to come to that realization. And for believers to assemble together with a church, body of Christ, it's called. Studying on your own is very important as well. I do not discourage it. I'm just letting you know. And in this study, we're going to talk about the need for a pastor teacher. But you're also going to see principles about uh, how to interpret the Bible, which is very important. Studying on your own, extremely important. Not trying to knock it down. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. He gave some, God gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. For what? Equipping the saints. Equipping the saints for the work of the service, building up the body of Christ. To be in the church, teaching. So God has ordained men to be pastor teachers. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. Then you get into miracles, gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. And as I've said before, um, we're going to talk about some of the some of the stuff on this list we'll talk about because it doesn't apply to the day and age we live today. But God is the one who ordains the pastors and the teachers. In Jeremiah 3.15, the Old Testament, Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart, who will feed you on knowledge and understanding. God is the one that gives you a man behind the pulpit. Romans 12, 6 and 7 speaks to operating in the gifts. Operating in the gifts that God gave us. We all should want to find out what our gifts are that God gave us. Teaching the Bible is one of the gifts that God gave us. Pastor, teacher, a church leader. Somebody we could call a spiritual father that trains us. John 21, 16 and 17. What did Jesus say to Peter? Feed. Feed my sheep, Peter. He's telling them. Feed my sheep. All the people that want to study the Bible. The believers. Jesus Christ designed an office for a pastor as a church leader and a teacher to feed his sheep. Plain and simple. It comes from God. It comes from Jesus Christ. It comes from the Holy Spirit. However you want to look at it. It's God ordained. Pastor, teacher. The Bible is clear that a man who God ordains as a pastor is to make his living as a pastor. It's, it's actually supposed to be an office that's ordained by God. A full-time service. Romans 12, you can study that. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 Corinthians 9, Galatians 6, 1 Timothy 5. All of those go into pretty good detail about not only the gift of pastor teacher, but working within the church realm, leadership roles, authority roles that you should study. Each one of those. Romans 12, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 Corinthians 9, Galatians 6, 1 Timothy 5. Men are the ones who God ordains for the role of pastor teachers. Sorry to tell you that. Ladies, don't get upset. 1 Timothy chapter 2 covers this issue pretty well. There's actually a couple other scriptures I could get into, but we would get sidetracked. So don't get offended. This may offend some, but it is biblical. Women can have leadership roles, but not the head of a church. Not being authority over a man in that realm, in a lot of realms actually. But uh, the pastor of the church has got to be male. A woman could be on the board of directors, she can be a prep school teacher, the head of finances, all kinds of stuff that she could be doing. She cannot be a deacon. That's a male role. These are things I can answer later on. You can send me your questions. And it's not to say anything against the ladies, it's just like in marriage. That God put the man ahead in marriage, but it's done in a way that the man is um, the head, but he's the authority. But he actually should be a good authority and a good leader, actually respects those underneath them and respects their opinion. If not, he's a bad leader. It doesn't mean he's the master and there's a slave under him. That's a whole principle and a lesson for another day. And a lot of men try to teach that to their wives and they're wrong when they do that. But unfortunately, ladies, that's not your role in the church as a pastor teacher. Neither is it as a deacon, okay? We'll get into it at a later date. So there's no doubt that a God-ordained... A God-ordained man should be someone you seek concerning Bible knowledge. It should be something you want to do. You want to interpret the Bible? Get under a God-ordained man. The Bible tells the pastor to work to the point of exhaustion. Not feed you fluff one hour a week from his emotions. That's nonsense. Not tickle your ears. 
as, as Paul taught uh, Timothy. 1 Corinthians 1, 24 through 29, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Paul goes into great detail, letting us know how difficult and the hard work that comes from being a pastor teacher. It's not about going out politically and getting involved in crazy stuff. It's about studying and teaching, studying and teaching, sometimes to the point of exhaustion. The pastor should take the word serious. That's his main goal, the word of God. Not running down the road counseling to everybody who's got a hangnail, unfortunately. Study and teach, study and teach. The word, so serious that he digs into historical context, original language, scripture against scripture to feed the Lord's flock with truth. Even when it's unpopular. Even when it's politically incorrect. Guess what? Sometimes the pastor's got to hit you over the head with truth. Sometimes the lesson isn't as exciting as you want it to be. But if he's dug the right way and dug up the truth the right way, historical context, line upon line, precept upon precept, original language, he's feeding you the right way, folks. The proper way to study scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, building blocks, building blocks. Isaiah 28, 9 through 19. Never to hang one scripture out there. That's not the right way. Take one scripture and hang it out there on its own and build doctrines around it. When somebody does that, that's false teaching. It's wrong. Please understand me. Never do that. For that matter, taking just a couple of scriptures, like two or three, that seem contradictory to each other and contradictory to the nature of God and trying to build doctrines around them. Be very careful of that. Fully investigate that, folks. Fully investigate that. I did something on Unlimited Atonement recently on this channel, and I tried to give you a bunch of scriptures that show you that God offered salvation to everyone. It's not limited, it's unlimited. Yet there are those that believe in that Calvinistic type of belief where they come out with two or three scriptures and they're strong with them and they give them to you and you start to realize, oh, well, maybe this says this. Maybe this says that. Maybe the Bible's contradicting itself. Please, do yourself a favor. Investigate. If you can come up with the 10 other scriptures and you know the nature of God and you know that they're twisting scripture and not really doing it the right way, studying it the right way, then call them out on it. Fully understanding the chapter, very important. Who wrote it? Why did they write it? Who are they writing it to? Historical context. What's the original language? The original language, whatever it depicts, that's very crucial. Very, very crucial. You got to take it serious. Ice principle. Some of you have heard of this. Maybe some of you haven't. The ice principle is something you should demand from your pastor. What is the ice principle? Isagogics, the I. Isagogics. Historical settings and historical terms. He better know them. Categorical. Scripture. Line upon line. Scripture against scripture. Does it line up with scripture? Okay. Exegesis, the E. Original language. A study in the original language you got to understand what the Bible's all about, when it was written, the time it was written, the language used. Most of it being Hebrew in the Old Testament, a little bit of Latin, um, Aramaic. And then and you get the Koine Greek, a lot of it in the New Testament is the Koine Greek. So they better be able to dig it up and find out the truth for you. The Bible is never taught from a position of emotional inspiration. Not just off the top of your head, teaching emotional nonsense. It's not to say occasionally... The Holy Spirit and the Scripture itself doesn't move a teacher or a student to cry or to have a little bit of emotion. That's okay. But there's not emotional waves of inspiration, and that's where your Bible teaching comes from and your interpretation. There are messages or spiritual movements from God the Holy Spirit that can bring a teacher to tears occasionally. Happened to me. But the majority of his teaching, listen to me now, the majority of his teaching and interpreting of the Bible should be rooted in academic honesty and discipline. Academic honesty and discipline. Hard work. Hard work. Personal Bible study can get emotional, but the student should take care that they are not carried away in an emotional wave. Be very careful. That will hinder you understanding and set them up. Basically, it sets somebody up for expecting every time, having an emotional response every time they seek God. Set you up for failure. If you allow emotional waves to come over you all the time, you're going to be expecting God to be this emotional um, experience every time, and that's just not the case. There's a lot of stadiums filled with a lot of nonsense out there that are uh, emotional waves going through the audience, 
And when they leave, they've got no doctrinal content. They've got nothing to live on. They've, 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 they've not really studied the scriptures the right way. So emotions can get you in a lot of trouble. Be careful with them. Relying solely upon, here's another area right here. Relying solely upon man's, one man's uh, biblical commentary can be, be very misleading for certain students. You've got to really understand what you're doing. In other words, you're following a commentary from one of these famous TV personalities, evangelists, whatever, and they write their own Bible and they do a commentary, and some of it's really good. But the problem is you're locked into their denominational dogma if, if you're not careful. So I'm just warning you. I'm not saying it's a horrible thing to do, but just be open to several interpretations and try to find out where the rubber meets the road and the truth is that. Pastors need to use a full range of resources. A full range. And if you're a student trying to interpret, you should do it as well. Commentaries are important, absolutely. But then again, so is the Greek and the Hebrew lexicon. Your concordance. The ancient writings that we can find out. Ancient uh, writings, by uh, I mean that by, by books that we can dig up that we know were written a long time ago. Maybe they were rewritten as long as they weren't um, interpreted the wrong way. They're very important. Trusted authors, historians that you trust. These are all very important. You need a lot of resources, folks, to study the Bible the right way. When several of your trusted spiritual leaders, your trusted authors and pastors, follow along the same vein, they follow along the same vein concerning biblical script, scriptures and biblical principles, you then only need the guidance of the Holy Spirit to confirm the truth because you've done the legwork. You've done the legwork. You put the hours in, right? So if several of your spiritual leaders, trusted authors, and pastors are all teaching very similar things on a certain scripture, the vein is very similar, you're in the right direction. God the Holy Spirit's taking you in the right direction. You can follow through with it and see what he's talk, telling you to do and see what the scripture means to you. But you can't just throw it off the top of your head without a serious study. My list of trusted men, I put them up here. They start with my own pastor, my own mentor. The guy who ordained me, who I trust, Pastor Robert McLaughlin, and the guy that trained him, Colonel R.B. Theme Jr., a wonderful pastor who's gone on, gone on to be with the Lord. Um, his son is still out there teaching. Though That's my spiritual father and spiritual grandfather right there. So I line certain things up with them, yes. But then I also go into other men, too. Charles Ryrie, the Ryrie Study Bible, great study Bible. Lewis Berry Schaefer, that's the line, the heritage that I'm in. Lewis Berry Schaefer, that's the bloodline where I come from, my great-great-great-grandfather, spiritual grandfather would be Lewis Berry Schaefer. Charles Spurgeon. There's a lot of writings from Charles Spurgeon I enjoy. I get a lot of truth from it. William Tyndale, Marvin Vincent. These guys are way back when. Way back when. This is my list that I go to. It's kind of my go-to guys. But I have others I, I look at as well. But some of the authors and pastors you read have varying denominations, varying beliefs maybe. So you must be solid in what you believe first. Otherwise, they're going to take you in all different directions if you're not careful. You can gain knowledge from any source in the world, folks. You can gain knowledge anywhere without giving up your core truths. This is very important. If your foundation is strong and you're based in truth, you're all set. You're not going to sway all over the place. You know, Bruce Lee was a guy that, uh, when I was growing up and got into heavy into martial arts, he, he developed a style called Jeet Kune Do, which means the way of the intercepting fist. And I actually studied uh, six or seven years under a guy that was deeply into Jeet Kune Do. Um, we started off with Wing Chun, which was a, a form of Chinese boxing. Gung Fu, as they say. Um, and he, Bruce Lee, developed this style Jeet Kune Do, the way of the intercepting fist. But he had an attitude of absorb what is useful and throw the rest away. So he could go into Kempo Karate and take a couple of kicks or blocks of strikes and use them. But the rest of it was too mechanical. Then he would go into uh, boxing. He liked Muhammad Ali's jab, like the way Muhammad Ali moved and threw a jab. So he absorbed that. But some of the other stuff that Ali did, maybe he didn't like. Fencing, some of the footwork he took from fencing. So you have to absorb what is useful and take the re and throw the rest away. you got to know to be able to do that as well. You have to have a foundation to do that. You have to be strong in your foundation to do that. I'm a firm believer, folks, in non-denominational teaching and dispensations non-denominational teaching and dispensations. It's been proven and it stands within solid scriptural context. I believe it does. Therefore, no teacher or author can lead me astray. They can't. Only the Word of God. Listen to me now close. Only the Word of God is my final authority 
and it can shape me and redirect me. Only the Word of God. So if a man presents me with something contrary to what I believe, he better have all kinds of scriptures to back it up. It better line up with who and what God is, the God I know. And he better understand the historical context and the original language so I can sit down and dig it up and see where he's trying to lead me. Because I won't follow unless it's the Word of God, God the Holy Spirit. This is why getting under the right teacher is so important. It's vital for believers. Get under the right teacher. Otherwise, you're stuck with Ephesians 4.14. As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves carried out by every wind of doctrine, blown all over the place. One month, you're into the Pentecostal movement. Six months later, you're into a Baptist movement. Then after that, you're into something else. By trickery of men, by craftiness, deceitful scheming. We're not to be children all our lives like this. We have to grow up spiritually and find out truth. So yes, interpreting the Bible becomes very important. Actually, it's one of the most important things you do in your life is having your relationship with God the right way, understanding it. Otherwise, it's emotional nonsense and confusing. There are Bible programs on TV. There's Bible TV radio shows and talk show hosts, uh, pastors on TV, internet, even computer programs that can help enhance your study. Go for it. I say go for it. But make sure you can decipher what's real and what's not. Ultimately, God has assigned you a pastor teacher. Ultimately, he has, whether you want to accept that or not. You need to find the one who touches your soul and feeds you with truth. Find him. Sit under him. Look, in the day and age we live in now, you can have an internet ministry uh, like I have here, and a couple of people can gather together, and it's a church. They might be watching on, on, on a, a computer screen. We simply don't know. But that's, maybe that's your church. But you've got to get truth. You've got to get a pastor teacher. No matter what you decide, you must always approach the Bible with respect and a serious heart. Respect and a serious heart. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit. We'll get into more of that as I go in this, uh, these messages. You will never have guidance from above without the filling of the Holy Spirit. The natural man cannot discern the things of God. Simply cannot do it. So look, I, I think about the apostles in the book of Acts, right? When uh, Judas Iscariot was gone, there was 11 apostles. So they took it upon themselves, the spiritual giants that they are, to decide uh, 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 that they were going to pick a new apostle for themselves. But God said, no, I have a guy, Saul of Tarsus. So the guy that they chose, Mathis, uh, um, he, he's, he gets picked by the, by the apostles, but he's not the right guy. It ends up being Saul of Tarsus, their sworn enemy, right? Paul. That becomes the next apostle. God ordains the man. God ordains the man. Keep that in mind. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this message received. Let us be able to take this, this question and answer out into a lost and dying world. Take it to our soul, Father, and use it in the future. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.